Good afternoon, everybody. Happy spring. Hope everybody is doing well in these extraordinary times that we are living in. Uh, after celebrating Easter and now in the middle of spring, I hope some of you and all of you are managing to find some joyous and hopeful moments. And I'm certainly feeling joyous that we are resuming our Mom's Luncheon Speaker Series. Granted, it's virtual, but we are doing it. And I am so, so happy to be here and to introduce our speaker today, although it's a conversation, not so much a speech. Many of you might know my friend and colleague, Lindsay Davis, but for those of you who don't, a few little factoids here. She's an award-winning journalist at ABC News where she has made it her business to tackle some hard-hitting and truth-telling stories about the times that we're living in. Lindsay Davis has reported on racial bias, police violence, and our presidential election over the last five years, among so many other things. She's anchor of ABC News Live Prime and recently got a very snazzy big job. She was named anchor of World News Tonight on Sunday. Lindsay is also a best-selling children's book author, mom to seven-year-old Aiden, wife to Paul, and a woman whose Christian faith is front and center in her life, which is one of the reasons we want to talk to her. So would you please join me in welcoming my friend, Lindsay Davis. Hey, Lindsay. Hey, Deb. It's so good to be here with you, albeit virtually, but together nonetheless. Yeah, we'll, we'll help. Hopefully you and I will see each other soon. We haven't seen much of each other these days, but it's so great to see you. And thank you for sharing your time and for sharing your story, because when we were thinking about somebody who might be relevant, relevant and fun to talk to today, I mean, your name came to mind right away because you and I don't have a lot of opportunities to connect and talk about our lives and our faith, but I certainly do know that you're a woman of faith. But before we get to that, I want to find out how you're doing, because so many of us are just uh, exhausted yes. <laughs> over this last year, right? How are you hanging in there as a mom, as a journalist who's been reporting on all these exhausting and traumatic stories and a woman who is trying to you know, pray about it and keep it all mm. together? Right. Pray and move your feet. Right. It's like you got to do both at the same time. Um, well, one, I have to say a game changer is that my son is going back to school now um, five days a week. Oh, and cool. that is so significant because where we live, it was the epicenter here in the United States initially. And so we were one of the very first school districts to go home. And initially when they said, uh, that they were kind of doing the virtual. It wasn't even virtual at the time. It was just uh, a, like a two week pause, essentially. And they kept saying, OK, we're going to open up. We're going to open up. And then that ended up being a year. And that was the thick of it, really, um, because we were just launching the ABC News Live Prime show in, in February. And it was like right after that, that I was having a major kind of shift as far as my, my, my time that I was going into work. And so I was going into work later. And so that was fortunate, but my whole day started with homeschooling now and trying to have recess. And I was making breakfast and lunch and dinner before I left. And, and so it was just crazy. Um, and, and so now I feel like I can really focus on, my my day job, so to speak, now that that someone else is focusing on educating my son for the most part. Yeah. You know? So, so <laughs> that teacher. has been yeah, just a, a big sigh of relief, I have to say, though, I would say, too, that, that during this year, we were sitting down together as a family for breakfast and for lunch every day. And that was such a blessing because one of the the kind of the angst that I had with starting the new schedule was that I was going to be gone in the night. So I wasn't really going to see my son except for maybe breakfast and to drop him off at school. And then that would be it. And so, you know, it ended up being that we were able to really get some tremendous quality time in there and feels like, you know, there's there's progress as, you know, it was that kind of like the year of the four P's, right, where you had uh, the pandemic and the police brutality and the protests and the president who wasn't quite able to, to bring us all together. Um, the more things change, the more they stay the same, though. I mean, because now you still do have this right now. I mean, I think we're all in kind of pins and needles with regard to the, the Chauvin um, verdict and, and what may come there. But then, you know, the shooting of Dante Wright just a few days ago and feels like we just haven't mm -hmm. made that much progress. Mm -hmm. um, and so so that that continues. And other shootings as well, too, which you and I have been covering. I have found 
not only has it just been exhausting as a journalist, but as a mother, you have a young black son, a seven year old son. We've talked about this. Um, I've just found it just emotionally trying over the last year, not only covering the story, but obviously living it like so many other people with your family, with your child, trying to talk about it and also trying to be hopeful and trying to rely on your faith. How about you? How, How have you done that this last year? Sure. This is the first time and I've been doing this for, you know, more than two decades now. This was really, I would say the, the earthquake in Haiti was a time that it was hard for me to separate and revert back to just like business as usual in my day to day. Like there, there, that was like a moment um, then. But this time I would say is unusual in that there's been this collision of the personal and professional life, right? Because we're covering this also uh, intimately and, and personally, I have been thinking about my own son as, as you say, raising a black son in this country. And, and the fact that he is only seven, mm. I have had, you know, just this angst about when do you have this conversation and when do you put this albatross around this kid's neck, really, that, that the color of his skin, because just simply because of that, people are going to perceive him differently in society and his, his actions have to be different. Right. Um, and and, and it, I remember during the summer I was we were walking down a, a beach street. So we were just in the middle of the road and he was skipping down the road ahead of me. And I just I, my heart, it was like in it, in both ways, I a tears just started coming because I was happy that he was skipping and he's so light. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I was feeling like I'm going to just have to at some point, when does this, when is he going to have to stop skipping? Right. Because innocence is going to be shattered. Yes. And it's just it feels like just a, a just such an unfair burden and weight. Um, and, you know, I, I was thinking about it at that time, like Tamir Rice was 12. Mm-hmm. And so there's some point within these next five years that if I if I were to wait until, you know, he's 12, he could potentially be too late. So it's really, really heavy times that um, I have been processing certainly differently as the mother of, of, of a black son. Yeah, I can imagine. Has it has it tested your faith this year, really thinking about everything that's going on and trying to rely on it, but also realizing the world keeps spinning in a very, very strange way? You know, I wouldn't say that it's tested. I would say it's brought me closer. So I could tell you right now here in my office, I have, you know, the the one year Bible that I've been going to every day where I I really have drawn nearer with faith because I I, at the office. I, I bring it both places whenever, wherever I am, it's home or I throw it in the bag with me if I haven't gotten a chance to do my daily read yet. Um, and today was one of those days. So I brought it to work with me. Um, but I have felt so uh, thirsty and, and hungry to uh, and drawn in to um, the, the, my relationship with God during this time in particular. I mean, and I don't want it to be, you know, I, I want it to be like this all the time, really. So I, I guess I can see it as, as a blessing in that way and that I have, you know, drawn nearer with faith. Um, but but yeah, so I don't know that it's tested. I never felt like, you know, why have you forsaken us? I, I've just been leaning in to get that extra comfort and wisdom, really, to endure this time. And it's helped. It's helped you uh, tremendously, I imagine. I, I would say 100 percent. Yeah, that and my runs, you know, I like to run a lot and that I think that we need kind of that that spiritual food, that emotional food, that whatever that physical thing that might get your, you know, endorphins flowing and the neurotransmitters firing <laughs> off. Um, yes, I, I would say those have been um, really I've started running a lot more and I've started reading the Bible a lot more. Yeah, I know that feeling. I've been running a lot more, too, and especially because the gyms were closed. So I just had to get out there. And right. Just <laughs> what about tell us a little bit, a little bit about your faith, because I, I didn't really realize I don't think that I mean, sometimes at work, I mean, for a lot of us, depending on what uh, work you're in, you know, you don't talk about your faith that often. And sure. you don't really know that there are other people who share uh, Christian faith. Right. And I, I don't think I knew how much you did until last year. Some of us were on a call, a bunch of colleagues were on a call and you read a Bible verse and, and, and sort of almost like led us in a way, uh-huh. in a very biblical way toward something we were all dealing with. 
how were you raised? Were you raised in the church? Was it important in your family? Was it something you came to later in life? Um, from the day I can remember, I was growing up in a church and, you know, I, I, I have a very vivid memory of this little doll purse that I had with braids and my mom would put like two or three quarters in that and I'd give my offering at the Sunday school. Um, and yes, this, it was really a ritual of the, the tradition of it every Sunday, uh, we went to church. Both of my parents uh, were raised in the same way. And so I think that it was kind of only natural then when when they kind of joined uh, that my I have an older sister, six years older than I am. And, and we would always be in church on Sunday. Um, and so it, to me, it was the, uh, there was never a point in life where I had questioned it because it just was the way that it was on Sundays. You you went to church. Um, it's what the family and I. What's that? It's what the family did. It's what the family did. And I never really, you know, I would say there were times that I was like coloring the program and whatever and not really paying attention. But there were times when I remember Reverend Vernal Sims. He was when I was a little girl. And sometimes I would really kind of feel like I kind of caught the spirit. So <laughs> it was never a time. There was never a time when. I felt like it was this burden and this thing that I didn't really want to do. And early on in life, I dedicated my life to Christ. Then we went and I went, you know, down in the water. And that was a decision that I made. You know, I was a teenager and it, my parents didn't have anything. You know, they just kind of went and took pictures that day. <laughs> um, but but it was it was it, I never felt pressured by them. I don't even know that they suggested that I do it. I just had been listening and they offered who wants to be baptized and. I, I felt early on that this, this was, you know, a kind of a foundation early on in my childhood and something that I felt I saw value in and I felt, you know, something moving in there uh, with with a lot of the sermons. And, um, you know, so that's how I ended up ultimately. Well, it's not why I wrote children's books, but my first children's book um, was uh, about giving this introduction to my own child to my son about, you know, who God is, just this kind of like gentle idea of, you know, how we are all part of his creation and all of his creation around us. And um, it's called The World is Wake a Celebration of Everyday Blessings. And it was specifically to answer a question that he asked me. Um, we were in the car and he was very young. He had just turned two and was just starting to talk. And he asked me, Mommy, does God open up the flowers? And I thought, oh, my goodness, I had already been thinking about writing a book, but I didn't know what I was going to write about. And in that moment, I felt like, let me try and really give a full answer to him and to other children um, uh, with a really subtle hand, not, you know, Bible beating or whatever, but just this this introduction um, to God. And so just as much as I, I did feel that my parents influenced me with going to church, I have felt the same for my son, but again, not so much where I want him to ever feel forced. I, I hope that he will have um, uh, his own personal relationship that, that he'll find value in as well. Yeah. And I want to talk about your children's books in a minute. And I think I said in the very beginning, she has uh, penned not one, but three best-selling children's books, madam. Um, but, but I want to talk about, um, you know, just sort of how your faith is sort of guided. By the way, um, we talked about your husband, Paul. Does he share... Um, your faith as well? Is, is he on a different path? Do you both go to church together? How does that work at home? Yes. Yeah, so we met because my cousin went to church with Paul and she was asking him, you know, what are you looking for in a woman? And he said, someone who likes to run. So it's very <laughs> low hanging fruit, right? That was it because I can check that box and maybe not many <laughs> others. But um, at that point, my cousin thought about me and then um, shortly after we we met and and I think our second date was was running together. Well, he was already um, in church. So she knew that was already pretty he good. was already in church. I would I would actually say Paul is even even though I, I would hope that I'm somewhat uh, far along in my walk with with God. But I would say he's even further. He oh. is he's not, you know. Uh, necessarily demonstrative, you know, um, again, Bible thumping or anything, but, you know, he is just a man of faith and he's the kind of person where, so he may not talk about it, but you see it, his light. Mm -hmm. And, and that is really a, a large part of what attracted me to him. 
you know, and he told me about this book when we were dating, it was called Driven by Eternity. And I ended up incorporating that into the vows that I, I wrote for him on our, our wedding day, because um, he is so most of us live just kind of on this earth surface and maybe we're we think we're good Christians and everything. But I just felt like he was further evolved. And I remember one of my lines, it was, you know, never change, change me, but never change, because I do feel that he's kind of, you know, a rock in that way and, and faith and and leads our family in that in that way so that was something so we had god and running in common <laughs> those are, i think those are two very healthy things to have in common that's great i mean i've met paul but i didn't i didn't know all those details about him and that's really great to know that he is a rock at home uh, from a christian perspective what about rituals do you have as a family uh, because oftentimes people will um, talk about in this luncheon rituals at home that kind of keep you grounded and keep you grounded in your faith Sure. Um, well, now, because we've been doing church from home and my son actually goes to his own little children's church virtually at this point. Um, but still on the first Sunday of the month, we have gone ahead of time. We have communion and have, you know, our little juice and the cracker. And and Paul leads us then through, you know, that process of the communion. And I don't even know, you know, what the particular scripture is, but we kind of go the through the this do in remembrance of me um, bit. And I, I really do like that he took the initiative with that because I had gone and, you know, was giving like, you know, my offering or something like that. And they said, hey, do you want some communion to bring home with you? And so I did. And I was just thinking we were just going to, you know, crack it open and drink and eat. And then that was it. And he really has uh, made it a, a priority to kind of set that example of it, that the first Sunday of, of each month. We we do this, you know, at, at home, just in the same way almost that you would yeah. um, as far as the tradition of it um, inside the church. Um one thing that I would like to be better at, and we do have this couple's book that is like a, a Bible, uh, you know, um, kind of, uh, it's, it, it's, it's like the par Yeah. It's like the parallel between, you know, marriage and biblical scripture and that kind of a thing. So it's kind of like a Bible study, but specifically for married couples. And I would like to get more into the regimen and ritual of that because it really asks a lot of questions of you. To, and, and there are things that in some, and we've been married for eight years now that some of the questions I'm like, huh, well, what I'm really curious to know what your answer is going to be. Like, I don't know. I don't know that. And, and I, I like that. And, and I really would like to do more of that. It's just by the time we both get into bed and it's like, I'm tired. I'm still doing more work or whatever. And then we just, that ends up being the thing that gets kind of kicked down. But but I would like to do uh, more of that together. Yeah, well, we all have to have goals in our faith. There's no question about it. What about, I mean, many times women um, in this luncheon or people in this luncheon, because we do have a few guys out there usually, um, they'll want to know kind of how your faith informs you during work. I mean, I don't know about you, but there are times when I'm about to do a big interview, or I'm about to do a big live report, and I'm just like really nervous. And I say a prayer behind the mm. scenes to myself, you know, for God to guide me and give me strength to say the right things, to do the right. And, you know, that's not something I necessarily share with people, but I do. That's just important yeah. to me. And I feel like that holds me. Um, what about you? How does your faith inform you when you're about to do, when you did that big interview with the vice presidential candidates, or no, it was a presidential candidates years ago, and, and I was holding my breath for you, and you were just like firing on all cylinders. Did you pray before that? How do you handle your faith when you're working and, you know, trying to keep yourself centered? Yes. Well, in general, when I'm about to kind of do anything, I just say, speak through me please speak through me, you know, and in life, I always kind of trying to have this mantra of like less of me, more of you. Um, now for that uh, first debate in September of 2019, I was prayed up. Deb. <laughs> I was like, I had all my prayer warriors out yeah. there for me. Cause I was like, needed to like cast all that anxiety on God because I was nervous about, you know, this moment and, you know, just it, it felt like just this big moment that I really felt I needed to be prepared for. And I constantly was trying to just cram more information and be ready. And uh, so I was ner I was really nervous. Interestingly, I was nervous in the from the amount of weeks leading up to it when I knew about it. But then when we got there to the, the our, uh, auditorium the day before and there was a rehearsal and I was sitting there, it was kind of like a little dry run. And I thought, 
boy, I'm not nervous. I, I thought to myself, like, boy, I'm not nervous. I'm surprised. I guess tomorrow I'll be nervous, you know? And then I got there, tomorrow came, and I was cool as a cucumber, I have to say. Oh, but I, uh, uh, a friend of mine um, had had uh, somebody who I've never met, uh, who's a part of a prayer call that she's on, uh, re- record a tape for me and so or, or record a, a prayer for me and so I played it in the hotel room before I went over and it just spoke to my soul in such a way that it was kind of like yeah you're God's child wow. for such a time as this like God has prepared you for this moment and mm-hmm. all you have to do is trust him don't mm-hmm. trust you just trust him and I I just automatically started having this calm I have to, if I can call out Byron Pitts, our colleague, he was staying in the same hotel. Uh, he was like, hey, sis, you know, I'm going to come up, come up and, you know, read a little scripture, pray with you beforehand. We did. Um, and I was grateful for that. Um, and uh, I did just feel like I was like floating around on on my own prayers and other people's prayers. And I, I do have to give, you know, God, all the, the credit for for that day, because I didn't I don't know that I had the faith in myself that I I would really rise to the occasion. And so I just you were gave it to God. You were I, did, I really was other people for sure. Lindsay, many and since we don't have the um, um, opportunity to have questions from the audience, many times uh, a main question will be, how do you impart your faith to your child? Um, mm-hmm. Many people there have children and they're working and they're in the New York City area. You live outside of the city. But how do you uh, and many, many of us are struggling to not only hold on to our faith for ourselves, but to try to impart it to our children. So how are you doing that with Aiden and, and sort of making sure that you feel like he's going to walk? A, a life of faith as best you can. Sure. Well, I love we are uh, we belong to a, a church in Mount Vernon, and virtually they have a children's church. My son is still part of that every morning, uh, every, every Sunday uh, morning at ten, um, and I feel like he gets great food uh, during that. Um, we have Here's taught him. Food. Yes, yes, we have taught him. Uh, from the time he first could speak, you know, to bless his food, to be grateful for, you know, the gifts that God gives us um, and to pray at night. You know, I I was really proud of him. I think that we all take pride in our different moments with our our children and what they what they uh, provide or do or whatever. But when he first learned the memorize the Lord's Prayer at a very early age, I just felt like, you know, again, Hopefully it's a, I think that we can fall into just the tradition of saying words. They don't really take on meaning, but I also think that a seed can be planted where later on, you know, something kind of takes root. And so um, I I also feel like we try and live it. Um, You know, yesterday he was uh, playing a little soccer scrimmage and, and this kid fell down and Aiden didn't help him up. And so I walked out on the field and I was like, no, Aiden, that's not you. You ask him if he's okay and you help him up. And he was like, well, he was on the other team. And I said, but that doesn't (laughs) matter, you know? And so um, I think it's just those like kind of little life lessons that aren't necessarily even like, you know, where we're rooted in the Bible or or talking specifically about scripture, but it really all can come back to it. Right. Cause it's like, love your neighbors, right. Be kind. And um, so Hopefully, a lot of it will stick, you know, a lot of the, the good, you know, um, spiritual food. And, and like I said, in the first book that, that I did as well was kind of like my, my thought of, you know, let me get some faith uh, built into his early foundation. And I think that's so key. And you're right. That's all you can do. You plant that seed and you hope it will grow. Before we leave, uh, you've talked about your book and so many uh, folks out there do have children and you've got three books. Um, Talk to them a little bit about how they can find your books. And also, do they all have, you don't overtly talk about religion per se, but you sort of, you talk about goodness and and lightness and happiness in these books, right? Tell people how they can get them and what they can expect out of your books. Sure. Well, you know, initially it was just going to be a one-off. The first book ended up doing really well and the publisher came back to me saying, hey, can we do another one? And so then we did another. And then uh, this third, I have another one coming out next year. The theme um, that has just been consistent and kind of thread throughout the whole uh, the, the series at this point is love. And so the first one, I would say, know that you're loved by God. The second one is really love each other. Um, and the third is know that you're loved by your parents, your grandparents. Um, so the, the second one is called one big heart, a celebration of being more alike than different. And that was really about 
wanting my son to kind of people will often say the kids don't see color. I totally disagree with that. Kids do see color. They just don't assign a value to it. It's adults who do that often. And so, you know, that was just like the climate in the country. I just felt um, let's just talk about this head on because kids do see color. So uh, let's just talk about, yes, we do have different features and hair and skin color and likes and dislikes and beliefs. Right. But in the end, um, God gave us this one big heart. And that's the most important part because that's where love starts. And so that was really just about like embracing diversity and embracing our differences. And this most recent book, Stay This Way Forever, I think is just about loving your children and, you know, for the different aspects when you kind of, as a parent, maybe you want to push the pause button or, or freeze certain moments of this like playground of childhood that, you know, are these fleeting moments that are going to slip away at some point. Right. And you never know the last time they're going to fall asleep in your lap or reach to hold your hand or whatever those scenarios may be. Um, and, and I just wanted kids who are reading it to know how much they're loved and cherished and adored you know, by their parents or by their grandparents. And so, yeah, the theme is, is really love. And as far as where they can get it, wherever books are sold, you can, you can find them. So Barnes and Noble or Amazon. Yeah. Support um, bookstores, support anybody who's selling books right now. Lindsay, you and I could talk all day, but I know you've got a show to do. And I think folks probably have, you know, other work they have to run off to do, but I just, I really, really can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this. And I've gotten a chance to know more about you. <laughs> but I knew. So now we need to have lunch. And really right. Exactly. Lunch. Because I'm also not used to getting just asked the questions. I'm like wanting to throw this back. Well, how, about, <laughs> how about you now? What do you guys do? What are some of your, but no. So yeah. I think this is going by so fast. This has I just know, been I the, know. the busiest was conversation. I tough, was I a tough interviewer or was it all right? Oh, you were easy. I was waiting for the deep probing questions. <laughs> no, that was That'll good. come with the next one. Okay. Okay. Davis, right. thank you so much for giving us your time and your inspiration and mostly your light. It was so great to see um, you today. And um, I hope you all go online and buy her books or go to bookstores and buy Lindsay's books. And thank you again for taking the time. And I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you, Deb.